Good afternoon, everybody. So um, I'm, I'm going to show you some of the work we're doing at uh, MIT Sensible City Lab, and sometimes in collaboration with uh, the office in Italy, in Torino. Uh, well, look at this slide. You know, this is something that people were really, really fascinated in the 90s. So 1993, when Mosaic comes out, 1995, when Nicolas Negroponte writes being digital, you know, people thought everything really would become virtual. And, um, well, some people really got very excited. So, for instance, Gilder 1995 said, uh, uh, we are headed for the death of city. Uh, the idea then, at the time, was the death of distance, because of the internet would mean the death of city. And, uh, you know, he concluded cities have leftover baggage from the industrial time. Well, it's a tough job to be a futurologist, as we saw this morning. Uh, especially people look back at what you said before, uh, we all know the story now, and the story is that actually the past 15, 20 years were really a huge boom of cities. Uh, this is an image from Tianjin in China. China itself is planning to build more cities than all of humanity ever built. And uh, that's an image I just took the other day from Singapore that was a picture from, from my, my hotel, you know, just cranes and construction. And, uh, we all know that uh, this year is the year that uh, half of the world's population is now living in cities, and according to UN projections, by 2030, over 5 billion people will actually be living in cities. So, what happened? Well, our impression, our thinking is that uh, the digital, what you see, I cannot point with this, but uh, what you see on the top, so the digital layer di didn't really kill the physical layer. But the digital and the physical are combining again to suggest new possibilities and new opportunities. So the digital, the physical on the bottom, and all the interfaces that connect them. In a certain sense, it's like bits and atoms finally coming together in promoting new possibilities in urban space. Uh, we think a new type of interaction design has to emerge in a something that puts together the people, yes, the technology, yes, but the sp city and the physical space as well. So, in this presentation, I will look at one particular dimension of this aspect. And this is when, because of this digital being layered onto the physical, we end up in search for new types of mapping and for new types of understanding. All of these layers superimposed on the physical space. They're just an image from Google Earth. And, uh, you know, something that comes to mind when you look at this, um, that's an old story by Lewis Carroll, and there's also an old story by Borges. That's the same thing, you know. And then came the grandest idea of all. We actually made a map of the country on the scale of a mile to the mile. Have you used it much? I inquired. Uh, it has never been spread out yet, said Manher. The farmers objected. They said it would cover the whole country and shut out the sunlight. So we now use the country itself as its own map, and I assure you it does nearly as well. Uh, the same thing is in a Borges story. But the idea here is that today we're not doing a one-to-one -one map. We're doing a 10-to-1, a 100-to-1, a 1-million-to-1 map by layering all this information on the top of physical space. And by doing this, we think that in the same way as Nolly 1747 actually defined modern map making, today we need to find new ways to make sense of this increasing wealth of digital data layered on the top of physical space, of bits layered on the top of atoms. And actually, mapping really is going from complexity, from something that's increasingly complex, to making sense of it get rid of all the information we do not really need and make it simpler, so from complexity to simplicity. And uh, based on this, I'll show you a few projects that uh, we've done in Boston. Um, the first one was in 2006 at the Venice Biennale. Uh, the Biennale was dedicated to city. That year was run, directed by Ricky Burdett from uh, the London School of Economics in London. And um, so what Burdett gave us was a pavilion to try to see how cities were changing, and in particular the city of Rome. And you know, today everybody has a cell phone, and we said, well, how can we use this information and try to analyze it in order to represent and map the city in a different way. So we had a pavilion with uh, all these different screens, 
And we would collect all real-time information coming from the cell phone network, uh, coming from taxis and buses, being sent to MIT, processed and mapped, and being sent back to the Venice Biennale. All the information was coming from Rome, was analyzed and then displayed in Venice at the Biennale. This was the pavilion with a few screens. Um, and you know, because we're here, I'll show you, we, we are very close to France, I'll show you, look at this, actually. Um, I'll, I'll start it in a second. So one of the things is um, uh, in mapping the city through cell phone, let me show you a very simple video that monitors cell phone activity in the city of Rome in uh, 2006, during the summer, when actually Italy and France were doing the uh, final of the Soccer World Cup. Uh, and that's actually when Italy won. And uh, you'll see it in a moment with, look at what happens on the cell phone network during that night. So that's Rome, and you can see the Colosseum in the middle, the river. Uh, what you see on the top is before the match. Uh, you know, it's a normal day in Rome, standard activity. And then... The match begins, silence, so nobody's talking anymore. France scores, Zidane, Italy scores. Half time, that's when you go to the bathroom and make a quick call. In the second half, End of normal time, first overtime, second overtime, Z Zidane got the red card, Italy wins. <laughs> <laughs> and then that night, actually, people went to celebrate on the top left in the center. It's the top left, you saw it. And the following day, they went to meet the, the prime minister again in that part of the city and then moved to the south. Uh, you see the big park there. You see this peak actually increasing in a moment. And you know, this is just the most basic type of information you can use from the cell phone network. Uh, if you want to be a bit more sophisticated, this was another map we've been showing at the Biennale. Here in red, you see the concentration of pedestrians. If you do a bit of artificial intelligence, you can actually get this data. It's all anonymized and uh, aggregated, but then you can estimate the density of pedestrians. It's not so easy in Rome because the first thing you, that would come to mind, you would think about, is actually look at the velocity. But usually pedestrians in Rome move faster than cars. Um, so cars are always in traffic jams. So it's not so easy. But uh, you take the density of pedestrians, and then you take buses and taxis. And what we wanted to show here is then, what about uh, uh, trying to track in real time the offer of public transport and the demand for public transport? How could we use this information in order to optimize the system and think about a future where it's not us going to follow the bus and going to the bus line, but it's actually the bus following us because it knows where people are and where they want to go. Um, well, the next step, we're still involved with this. We said this was interesting, but the data was from Rome and we were showing it in Venice. So not really a feedback loop in that. You know, people would see it at the Biennale, it was interesting, it was an analysis. But what if you take this information and you give it back to citizens? What if you try to create a real-time control system, real-time feedback loop in the city itself? Then it becomes really, really interesting. Then the city starts behaving like a real-time control system like, say, a Formula One engine, something that you control, you understand, and then citizens can change as a system. So this was a test we started doing by putting this information back in the city center and giving it to the citizens. Um, I'll show now a project in, uh, that's on in Barcelona now. Actually, it's a project that uh, Fabian was leading when he was in, uh, in Boston in the group. And um, the idea here is, uh, you know, let's now take a different approach. Let's try to make sense not of the big networks that we all know about, but let's try to make sense of all this increasing wealth of data that's coming from the bottom. And, you know, there's plenty of people out there taking pictures, and plenty of this, these pictures then end up on Flickr. Now, if you then take the Flickr database, start analyzing, uh, develop script to see the timestamp on the pictures, then you can get interesting information. In the first work, actually, that Fabian and the team did, uh, that Fabian did at the beginning on Florence was looking at, you know, you can see the density of pictures being taken. Um, got all of Florence, um, all of Tuscany. In the middle, you got Florence, and then you got uh, the Duomo uh, to the right. Uh, and then you can also look at how different people move on, uh, on the space. Look at this, for instance, this is uh, Italians and Americans, how they move in Tuscany. 
And you do that by actually looking at the timestamp on the pictures. All of this is shared publicly with everybody. So uh, in the Americas, you see this kind of elephant's path, uh, which is quite understandable. If you only have a few days, you will actually go to the main spots in Tuscany. While for the Italian, you see this very much more fine grain uh, pattern. Um, cutting a long story short, so the project uh, at uh, the Design Museum in Barcelona um, yes, so actually you can actually then start to look at the pictures, what the picture, the meaning of the picture is. Uh, you can use the tags associated to the picture or you can actually use uh, image processing to try to get the meaning of what the picture means. So what you see here is actually where is the art in Barcelona, where are the pictures that are related to art, either because of the tag or some other type of identification and where they come from over time. So that's a week in 2007 and you see how all of them are produced and, uh, and are, are generated. And actually, we can probably jump to the next video. Uh, and th this is actually, where is the color green? So here what you're doing actually is like uh, borrowing all the eyes of these hundreds of thousands of people, these millions of people out there on the field taking pictures. It's like in being like sensors that collect information about the world, upload it, share it. And then by doing this, for instance, you monitor the green, the level of green in different parts of the country. Um, you know, you don't know if it is all green about vegetation, but this could be interesting over the summer when there's a lot of draft problems in Spain and you can actually see, monitor almost in real time the country using all this information that's uploaded by the people out there in the field. And uh, that's okay with the video. Um, oh, and, um, and in Boston, there's now a number of uh, people trying to make do very sophisticated correlation to prove if there might be any correlation between the geography of Brits and the geography of parties in Barcelona, actually. That's what you see over there. Um, I'll show you briefly a following project. That's uh, a project at the MoMA. It was a few months ago. And at the MoMA, initially, they contacted us and just wanted to show again the Venice Biennale project. But we thought that was not really interesting, so we said, why don't we do something new? And okay, Let's look at big networks, but not at the city, but at the global patterns. And this was part of the exhibition that uh, Paolo Antonelli uh, did at the moment called Design and Elastic Mind, and in partnership with AT&T. So uh, the first idea was how can we take the network of AT&T and look at how New York connects with all of the planet. So what you see here, every line is a connection going to somewhere on the planet. We don't see all of the cities, we see the top few hundred cities on the world in terms of megabytes being transferred. And what you see also on the surface of the planet, um, the bright spots, uh, those are actually the megabytes being transferred and ending up there. And you see the dark side is, oops, almost. Yes, and you see the, um, uh, the dark side is uh, nighttime and the, the, the brighter side is daytime uh, on the planet. And, uh, well, that was just to give a sense of the overall flows of megabytes and how they change with geography and with time. You can zoom in, you can see actually that's Europe waking up. Look at London, you know, the connections, uh, the financial, what was the financial district probably, connections with New York. And then you go South America, and you got uh, Buenos Aires and the main hubs over there waking up in the morning. Intensity increases a lot. All of this was in real time coming from the AT&T network. You got Asia going to sleep, so the amounts of bits diminishes. And you know, I can do a lot of this. Um, the interesting thing is actually what a number of people in the group are doing now. There's a, a few PhDs and postdocs. Is look at this data and analyze it. So if you analyze it, you can really try to better understand how all these cities are exchanging information and they're connected together. You can really understand something about uh, the production and the flow of information between this global network of cities. You can also do something else, is zoom into the city and look at uh, how one pixel is actually connecting a different way to the whole planet. So what you see here is uh, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Staten Island, the Bronx and Queens and how each of those pixels is actually each of those 
part of the city is actually connecting a different way with the whole planet. And you can zoom in, you got like a DNA structure of uh, the planet, uh, of the city, uh, that represent in color code all of the world. So how much of South America you have in different parts of New York. Uh, we call the map the world inside New York, so telling you uh, how much of that community you had in that specific pixel. It's very interesting that uh, after the moment, we actually got a lot of people contacting us to try and to get this data that uh, we couldn't give. It was AT&T data, but uh, it was from um, um, airline companies trying to see how this could help them plan routes in a different ways. Um, it was uh, from um, people like Western Union uh, trying to see how you could market things. And I think the most funny one was from politicians trying to say how they could optimize their presentations in different parts of the city. Uh, we're doing quite a lot of analysis at the moment. That's from Seed Magazine, the latest issue. And, uh, well, I'll skip this. Uh, I thought I'm from MIT. I had to put a few formulas there. <laughs> Um, I'll show you the, f the next project is a bit different. In this case, it's a project with uh, uh, the group at Boston and the office in Italy and uh, together and uh, shown at the World Expo in 2008. And here the idea of bits and atoms and mapping actually was a bit different. Everything started in something that we did uh, two or three years ago at a class uh, with Bill Mitchell and Dennis Frenchman and myself and a number of students at MIT for the city of Zaragoza. Uh, the city of Zaragoza had just won the expo, expo that was uh, dedicated to water. The theme of the expo was water. And uh, the mayor came to us and said, how can we do something with water and technology? And the initial idea in the class that was developed was, what about trying to use digital water? Something that had been done before, you know, like a screen made of water with many, many pixels. You open and close many solenoid valves and create like pixels made of water. But how could we do that and do it outside in the public space? How could you use this as a type of architecture? So imagine you got a pipe, you got all these solenoid valves opening and closing. It's a bit like an inkjet printer, like a water printer that you open and close and you create pixels made of water. And then if you put sensors, you can have like a responsive material. So people could jump, it opens. Uh, the, the idea of the students was, what if you can throw a ball at the water, it will open with a circle just to let the ball through the, this thing. Um, the mayor liked it very much. Uh, somebody said it was because uh, when we presented it, it looked a, li a little bit like, uh, you know, Mose, you approach it and it will open and, you know, you will lead your folk through the water. So he liked it very much and uh, asked us to design a pavilion at the entrance of the expo called Digital Water Pavilion. And this is the first video we did, like, a little over a year ago. Uh, there's a bit of sound. I don't know if... Doesn't matter. Um, but the idea that you approach it and then it will open, it will let you into the, into the pavilion. And uh, it becomes like a living uh, type of partition. And then you get inside. The roof of the pavilion is also covered with water. What you see at the end is actually a new bridge by Zaha Hadid, just next to the site that's uh, where you enter the expo. If there's wind, you can actually lower the roof, so you minimize splashing. And you can actually close down the pavilion. So the idea is that the full architecture can disappear. If you, if you shut it down at night or during the winter, uh, the, full the whole architecture can disappear. Our idea was, you know, there has been a lot of fascination in architecture about spaces that can expand and shrink and adapt to people. It's very difficult to do that if you use bricks and mortar. And then it always looks very clumsy. But with digital water, actually, you can do it. It's something that you can actually stop and you will not have a partition, you can open, you can expand it and shrink it. Well, this was the video, and uh, if you had asked me just a year ago, I would have said it would never be built. It was a fun project, but never be built. But actually, uh, one of the beautiful things of working in Spain is how people get enthusiastic and, uh, and really like the project and decided it just four months before the expo to build it, so we put together a team with uh, MIT and uh, the office in Torino, uh, graphic designers in Paris, uh, in, in Milan, FM Studio, uh, landscape architects in Paris, and a construction company in Spain. 
it was interesting, the construction company in this case was not a regular construction company, it was in the end Siemens, so somebody who's doing a lot of uh, uh, networks and uh, automation. Here are the first pictures uh, taken at the opening. It, it opened 80%. Hopefully, this year in 2009, it will be fully working, and they are planning a festival. So this, this was a guy from the team from MIT testing the water. This was somebody a bit puzzled. See the guy to the left at the beginning when we were testing the system. You can see you can like cut and carve the, the water and the walls. Um, this is when you go down this long boulevard. The idea of the pavilion is that it's only a thin, piece of roof on a boulevard that raises and lowers so that uh, uh, when it's down there's no architecture, you just have the boulevard and when it's up you have this 3D water architecture. Uh, this is uh, some testing with uh, projections and this was me trying not to get wet uh, entering the building and here I've got an interesting story. Uh, so you got sensors on all the sides of the building opening and closing to let you in and let you out. However, one day, uh, all the sensors didn't work. I think probably the operating system was Windows and, you know, it crashed. And so all the sensors didn't work. And actually what happened that night was quite impressive because all the kids from Saragossa came to the building because the pavilion had become something else. Before it was a space where you approach it, it will open and let you in. So it was something that would be servient, would, uh, would uh, adapt to what you wanted. But that night, the pavilion became its own thing with cuts and holes in the water, and the game was to go through the water without getting wet. So actually, we thought it was interesting that interaction is not always about doing something that will please uh, the person that's interacting, but in this case, people really loved when the pavilion became more like somebody you had to cheat and play with and engage with. So it was interesting, and we kept it for a while with the sensors not, work, not running. Uh, I'll go very, very quickly through some slides, because the time is, is, is close to over. Um, just to tell you something about the future projects and directions, things we're doing. That's a project in Copenhagen for the UN Climate Summit at the end of this year. And what we're planning to do, you know, Copenhagen, 30 years ago, no bicycles. Today, really, almost two th uh, one third of all trips in the city are done by bicycle. And we're planning to try to augment the bicycle by doing a few things. First, by re reusing the energy when you're braking, um, using a regenerative braking system to collect, capture the energy uh, and save it. And with this energy, to run a few sensors about air quality, telling you the quality of the air you've been going through. Uh, torque measurements to see, so it's like a health monitoring system for you while you're biking. Uh, and most importantly, location. In this case, with the idea of an application we developed on Facebook called like, Cross Your Path. So at the end of the day, you can actually go home and see the people who've been crossing your path week while biking. Uh, I'll skip it very quickly. It's like taking a Prius and putting it into the wheel, very, very small. And it's only in the wheel, so you can retrofit it to any bike. Uh, you might want, and you measure exposure, and there's a first prototype, is what you see in the video, but we'll probably skip it, just a couple of, just one minute. Uh, there's a Bluetooth connection from uh, the front, where you can actually choose what type of uh, uh, harvesting and what type of energy you want. Uh, we did this in collaboration with uh, Smart Cities Group at the Media Lab, Bill Mitchell's group. And you know, if you want, you could go for half an hour with, uh, in, in, in this mode without pedaling. And finally, just a couple of slides on Trash Track, a project we're doing in New York and um, doing for the Architecture League in September. And the idea is to put very small tags on trash and then be able to follow trash. And if you take my computer, you know every, everything about it, where it was built, it was assembled in Taiwan, sent to Cupertino, sent to your desk. Once you put it outside your door in a few years, then you don't know anything anymore about it. And it might end up in Africa, pollute the field, uh, it might not be properly dismantled. The idea is we put a few thousand tags into the trash in New York and then we follow it. And the first step is like this, looking at this last journey of our everyday objects. But really the second step is how can we get this information and try to better understand the sanitation system in order to improve it. The conclusion is really how can we put together bits and atoms, combine them uh, in different ways, and uh, 
just to finish, uh, our contacts and really all the people who did these projects, you know, I'm just here having fun and presenting them, but the people who did the hard work are listed there. Thanks a lot.